بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace be upon all of you thank you reverend andy for that very thorough uh, introduction to uh, jesus in the christian tradition um, I'll, i'll just get to it uh, so who is uh, jesus christ the son of mary isa ibn maryam peace be upon both of them of course here we have uh, the temple mount the masjid qubba al sahra the dome of the rock uh, the western wall there So just begin by quoting some verses from the Quran in translation. <clears throat> This is from the third chapter of the Quran, uh, starting at verse 42. And remember when the angel said, O Mary, surely God has chosen you, purified you, chosen you above the women of all nations. O Mary, be devout to your Lord, and prostrate yourself, and bow down with those who bow down. This is the news of the unseen that we reveal to you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You were not with them when they cast lots to decide who would be uh, Mary's guardian, nor were you there when they argued about it. Remember when the angels proclaimed, O oh Mary, God gives you glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, honored in this world and the hereafter. And he will be one of those nearest to God. Continues. And he will speak to people in the cradle and in adulthood and will be one of the righteous. Mary wondered, my Lord, how can I have a child when no man has touched me? The angel replied, so will it be. God creates what he wills. When he decrees a matter, he simply says to it be and it is. And God will teach him, i.e. Jesus, peace be upon him, revelation and wisdom, the Torah and the gospel and make him a messenger to the children of Israel to proclaim, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will make for you a bird from clay, breathe into it, and it will become a real bird by God's leave. I will heal the blind and the leper and raise the dead to life by God's will, or God's leave. And I will prophesize what you eat and store in your houses. Surely in this is a sign for you, if you truly believe. He continues. And I will confirm the Torah revealed before me and legalize some of what had been forbidden to you. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so be mindful of God and obey me. Surely God is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone. This is the straight path. And now we jump to chapter 61, verse 6. And remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am truly God's messenger to you, confirming the Torah which came before me and giving good news of a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmad, the most praised, which is one of the names of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yet when, uh, yet when he came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is pure sorcery. Okay, so, according to the Quran, Jesus, peace be upon him, was a great prophet of God, a, a great Nabi or Navi, These languages are very close, Hebrew and Arabic. A great messenger of God, a Rasul. He's called the Messiah, Al-Masih, Al-Mashiach. He was born from a virgin. He was the worker of miracles, the Ibnillah, by the permission of God. He is a great teacher and reviser of the Torah. He is the predecessor of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jesus was a spiritual master, bringer of the gospel, which is called an Injil in Arabic. And he's a human being in all respects. It's not divine. Interestingly, according to most historians, the historical Jesus was most plausibly a self-proclaimed prophet. And I say self-proclaimed because secular historians, they don't entertain the supernatural in their method of historiography. Right? It doesn't mean that they deny the supernatural, but that's not how modern secular history is done. So they're not going to say he was a prophet, but what did he actually claim historically? Okay? So he was a self-proclaimed prophet. This is probably what he claimed. He claimed probably to be some sort of messiah. He claimed to be a teacher and reviser of the law of Moses. In other words, he was a rabbi. He claimed to be some sort of healer. He claimed to be a teacher of great spirituality. 
He claimed to be the announcer of someone after him. So in the synoptic tradition, the Bar Inash, the son of man, who will come to earth and set up his kingdom and defeat the fourth beast. In the Gospel of John, the Johannan Gospel, Hapericletas, the paraclete, someone to come after him who will guide you into all truth. And someone who did not claim to be divine. This is what most historians will say about the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Peace be upon him. The Christology of the, and interestingly, going back to this, it's interesting, the uh, position of the historians regarding the historical Jesus is very close to Islamic Christology as to what the Quran says Jesus claimed to be. The Christology of the Quran. So what's really important is to establish what's known as the central theological consistency. Okay, so for example, in the Torah, it says, Lo ish el vi chazev, in Hebrew. God is not a man that he should lie. And the meaning of this, according to Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea, is that whoever claims to be God, any man who claims to be God, is a liar. Ki anuchi el, velo ish, Hosea 11.9, indeed I am God, and not a man. Every man is put to death for his own sin, Deuteronomy 24.7. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18, a long sustained argument for personal responsibility. The sin of the father does not pass to the son. The sin of the son does not pass to the father. But if the wicked should turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. What does it mean to turn, to shuva, tauba, right? To literally turn your body or to reorient yourself to God, to repent to God. This is the way to become right with God, through repentance. Whoever is hanged on a tree is accursed by God. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Do not drink blood, a chukath olam, an everlasting statute among your generations. Leviticus 3.17. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. One means one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. This is called the Shema. Right? And this is actually quoted by the New Testament Jesus at one point. It's only in one gospel. And Matthew and Luke had access to Mark, but they did not choose to include this in their gospel, where Jesus quotes this verbatim. Here, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he continues, You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the greatest commandments. And Rabbi Hillel, some say Akiva, was asked, what is the Torah in a nutshell? And he said, Deuteronomy 6.4, Deuteronomy 6.5, Leviticus 19.18. God is one. Love God, love your neighbor, everything else is commentary. Not that it's not important. He's a rabbi, but this is the essence. Human sacrifice is evil, many places. Blood is not necessary for the forgiveness of sin. Psalm 51, Second Chronicles chapter seven. And the last one here, for I know that God saves his Messiah. He shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand, David writes. Psalm 20, verse 6, God saves his Messiah. I'll come back to this verse. So we have to establish this consistency with the revelation given to Moses and the Hebrew prophets and what is given to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, to establish his bona fides, as it were, as a true prophet of God. The Christology of the Quran, a restoration of Jamesonian Nazareanism. The Nazarenes under James the Just, which reflected the original teachings of Jesus the Nazarene, Yeshu Ahanutsri, and his original followers who were called the Nazarenes, Hanutsrim. Here's a verse from the Quran. O oh, believers, stand up for God, as Jesus, son of Mary, asked the disciples, Who will stand up with me for God? The disciples replied, We will stand up for God. Then a group of the children of Israel believed while another disbelieved. We then supported the believers against their enemies, so they prevailed, 61.14. So this verse, according to our classical exegetes, 
indicates that within the children of Israel, there was a division. And the word used in Arabic is a ta'ifa. And a ta'ifa means a group, but it could also mean one man. So this verse seems to indicate this Paul versus James paradigm. Paul versus James. This is an early split in the early first century of the common era among Christians, Jewish Christians, early Nazarenes. This is mentioned everywhere. F.C. Bauer mentions this. Robert Eisenman, you can read him. James Tabor, Bart Ehrman, many others. This tension is seen in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 2, men from James are Paul's opponents. Men sent from James. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Corinthians demanded Paul to produce something called the letter of authorization. Where is your letter, letter of authorization? What does that mean? Well, presumably he needs a teaching license from James, right? Because everyone answers to James, even in the book of Acts. Everyone answers to James. If you're not authorized by James, this in Arabic is called an ijaza. If you don't have a teaching license, then you're a freelance apostle, and you don't have any authority. Okay, so the Corinthians are demanding from Paul of Tarsus to produce this leather authorization. Interestingly, in the Gospel of Thomas, which is sometimes labeled a Gnostic gospel, which Gnostic does not have a good connotation in Christianity. In, in, in Islam, it's a good thing. An Arif Billah is a good, Ma'rifah is, is beautiful, right? <laughs> but in Christianity, a Gnostic is a deviant, right? But there's other studies on the Gospel of Thomas that reveal it to be just as Gnostic as the Gospel of John. This is eternal life to know you. Ginosko is the verb in Greek. To know you, the only true God. That sounds very Gnostic. That's John 17.3. Right? So other scholars say, no, the Gospel of Thomas, which is very interesting, is a sayings gospel, 114 sayings of Jesus. There's no narrative. Right? Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. Logion number 12. When I am gone, you must go to James the Just. For whose sake heaven and earth came into being. And this is a way of saying that James the Just is the one man on earth who has the truth from me. He has the, he has the correct yachiduth, tawheed. He has the oneness of God. And you must report to him. A hyperbolic praise of James. Who is James? The brother of Jesus. The head of the Nazarene messianic movement for 30 years. A lot of people haven't even heard of James. James is not even mentioned in the Gospels by most accounts. James the Less is not, he's not a disciple. The, the disciple mentioned in, in the four Gospels, that's not James the brother of Jesus. It seems like he's been sort of systematically written out of the Gospels. The head of the early messianic movement for 30 years, yet none of the writings of the New Testament were authentically written by James, according to the vast majority of critical scholars, including the Epistle of James. This is considered to be pseudonymous according to the vast majority of critical scholars. James did not write this. Who is the principal author of the New Testament? Paul of Tarsus. Seven of the books, of the 27 books, almost by consensus of historians, was written by the historical Paul of Tarsus. Another six are written in his name, that is to say, pseudonymous, that is to say, someone is pretending to be Paul. And the book of Hebrews was attributed to him, uh, but is actually anonymous. So Paul is the principal author of the New Testament. Who wrote the four Gospels? The four Gospels were not called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until Irenaeus in the year 180 of the Common Era. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So these books are anonymous. They're written by Pauline Christians. Paul's Christology, Paul's Gospel, he says. And Paul calls it my Gospel. Evangelio mu, that's what he says. My Gospel, right, is all over the four Gospels. What is the Q source document? This is very interesting. So according to the vast majority of New Testament scholars, when Matthew and Luke are sitting at their desks, they have two things in front of them, at least two. They have the Gospel of Mark, because they had word for word, verbatim agreement with Mark in many places. Sometimes they edit Mark, right? But they also have agreement among themselves, Luke and Matthew, that is not in Mark. Word for word, verbatim in many cases. That means they have something else on their desk. And this is called Q, the Quella in German, the unknown. Sometimes this is called the sayings gospel. 
Uh, Dr. Dennis MacDonald, he calls it the first gospel, the original gospel. What does Q say about the crucifixion? Well, to quote John Dominic Crossan, eminent New Testament historian, there is, is a direct quote, there's nothing, nothing, nothing in the gospel according to Q about the crucifixion of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus. Thus, according to historians, the earliest known source of the gospels, what do I mean early, earliest known source? Q, according to most gospels, predates Paul, is pre-Pauline. The four gospels, if you, if you open a New Testament, you'll see Gospel of Matthew. That's the canonical order. That's not the chronological order. Paul wrote all of his letters, and they were well circulated before Mark wrote his gospel, the first gospel. Paul is writing in the late 40s, early 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Mark is in 70 or so. This is a dominant opinion. But Q, according to most scholars, maybe it had various strata of, of authorship, but Q in its original uh, um, authorship is pre-Pauline. Some even put it in the 40s and reflects an authentic Jamesonian Christianity. So that's why I say, according to historians, the earliest known source of the Gospels says nothing, nothing, nothing about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So I would say there's three stages of Christological conflict between proto-Islam or Islam. And so we believe that the religion, the actual religion of Jesus and the disciples was Islam in the sense that they were submitters unto God, right? Just as Moses was a submitter unto God and Abraham was a submitter unto God, a monotheist. Islam does not mean necessarily a Muslim does not mean necessarily strictly a follower of the Prophet Muhammad We're not Muhammadin, right? Islam in its perfect and pristine and latest form came to us through the Prophet Muhammad But all of these prophets are Muslim prophets. So that's why I'm saying here proto-Islam, Islam, and Christianity, right? Whoever does the will of my father, you know that saying in the Gospel of Mark, Say, Jesus, your mother and brother are here. Who is my mother and brother? Whoever does the will of my father, that is my mother and my brother. Whoever sub submits his will, that's called a Muslim. So, so you have these three stages of conflict. Christological conflict, early, post-apostolic, and modern. The early stage, the earliest stage, Jamesonian Nazarenes versus Pauline Nazarenes. This is in the first century. This is presented very vividly in Galatians, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, right? Paul has these enemies, and he doesn't like them at all. And these aren't like pagans. Well, he doesn't like the pagans. And these aren't just Jews. He doesn't like them that don't believe in Jesus, right? But these are other Christians. These are his primary opponents, are other Christians. This conflict is very downplayed in the book of Acts. Because Acts is trying to smooth things over a little bit. So when you read Acts and you listen to a sermon of Peter and Paul, it's almost like the same person. And in fact, it is the same person. Is Luke writing it. Luke is the actual author of whoever wrote the Gospel of Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And the Quran alludes to it in that verse I read. Of two, uh, the James the James-Pauline uh, paradigm. And then you have the post-apostolic stage. So this is called Ebionism versus Proto-Orthodoxy, or Orthodoxy. So who are the Ebionites? So the second century saw this emergence of a group called the Ebionites, Evionim, right? Which means the poor people. Now this is a derogatory term that was invented for them by Proto-Orthodox Christians, right? Like Origen of Alexandria and others, who said these people, they have a very poor Christology. They don't even worship Jesus. They don't believe he's divine. These are mesakin theologically. They're so poor. They didn't call themselves Evianites, right? These are Nazarenes. These are Jamesonian Nazarenes. So you have these Evianites versus Proto-Orthodox, so the second century to the seventh century. So we see that tension in the polemical writings of the patristic fathers, right? Uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Gaul, Clement of Alexandria, 
um, the, the Panorion, um, who was it? Epiphanius of Salamis, etc., etc. And then you have the modern stage, oh, as well as the, the so-called pseudo, the uh, Clementine literature. So in the second, third century, you have this literature that comes out uh, that's attributed to the uh, Jewish Christians who are anti-Pauline. This was written later, but it sort of reflects their positions. So they considered Paul, for example, to be an apostate rather than an apostle, uh, idolater. They believed Jesus was a human being, that he was some sort of prophet messiah. And then the modern stage, Islamic Unitarianism, or we, what we might say Quranic Christology versus Christian Trinitarianism, so 7th century to the present. So according to people like Robert Eisenman, who, um, you know, James Tabor, these are eminent New Testament scholars, there's a clear trajectory of Christology that starts with Jesus of Nazareth, peace be upon him, and moves to his brother James, and goes from the Jamesonian Nazarenes to the Ebionites to Islam. This is a clear trajectory. And of course, Robert Eisenman, who's an atheist, right? He can't just say, well, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he restored the gospel through revelation. He can't say that because he's an atheist, or he's trying to be secular. So he says, well, there must have been some Ebionites hiding in caves in, in Mecca, going to a cave, and here's an Ebionite. Hey, how you doing? And he's you know, taking notes from this Ebionite. And, and uh, so that's how he came up with this. That's how he knew it. So then there's a clear line of trajectory then from Paul, right, to the Proto-Orthodox Fathers, to the Ecumenical Church Councils, Council of Nicaea, where uh, the Son of God officially becomes uh, God the Son. And then in 381 at Constantinople, the Holy Spirit is now the third person officially of the Trinity, etc., etc. Ah, Messiah wasn't crucified. So this is a verse I promise I come back to. Psalm 20, verse 6. Ata yada'ati ki hoshia Adonai Mashiacho. Ya annahu mashemi kutsho big vuruth yasha yamino. What I underlined there says, Hoshia Adonai Mashiacho. God saves his Messiah. Messiah. This is in the Hebrew. Mashiach. The Quran says, and on account of their, some of the Jews, denial of their saying against Mary, a great slander. And they're saying, we have surely killed the Messiah. And of course, they're saying this in mockery, this so-called Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the so-called messenger of God. And then God says, in fact, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them as if they had. So this is a major point of contention between Christians, at least traditional Christianity, and traditional Islam. And indeed, those who differed over him, meaning Jesus, are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it, just following conjecture. And certainly, they did not kill him. So I just reproduced here a page from the Strong's Concordance. You know, if you read it in a Bible in English, you read the Old Testament, you'll come across a name, Jeshua. Right? You heard this name before? Jeshua. And you get to the New Testament, you see the name Jesus. You know these two names are exactly the same. Jesus' name is Jeshua. But for some reason, in the English, Bibles, he's called Jesus. But the same name in Hebrew, Yeshua, in the Old Testament, is Jeshua. So up here on the top, it says Yeshua, this is the name of Jesus. It means like Josh, right? And if you look down at the bottom, the meaning is he is saved. This is the meaning of the name Jesus. He is saved. And the names of prophets have significance. Avraham, right? The father of nations. The Ab, Av, the father of all nations, right? Moshe. Moshe is actually not Hebrew. Moshe, according to most historians, is an Egyptian name. Moz, like Amos, an Egyptian name, one of the pharaohs named Amos, born of Ah, the, the moon god. <laughs> Tut Moz, Tut Moses. Born of Tot, the god of magic. Ramoses, Ramses, born of Ra, but just Moses. So when he was found in the Nile by the family of Pharaoh, they knew he was an Israelite. They don't know the name of his god. He's just born of someone. We don't know. He's Abd something, right? Abd of someone. We don't know the name of his god. 
So the, that verse said, just following conjecture about the crucifixion. So the crucifixion is not in the pre-Pauline Q gospel. That's something very interesting. You know how I said Matthew and Luke have something, have the Q source on their desk along with Mark. We can piece together the contents of Q even though it's not extant. How do we do that? Well, you look at Matthew and Luke and whatever they have in common that is missing from Mark and not unique to their own gospel, they took that from Q. And if you look at all this Q material, you will be hard pressed to find anything that contradicts Islamic theology. You'll be very hard pressed. So Q is pre-Pauline. There's no passion narrative. There's no passion prediction in Q. There's no passion narrative. There's no passion prediction in the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas written around the time of the Gospel of John. John is a canonical gospel. Right? Some say even earlier than John. Some say Thomas has different strata. It's just as Gnostic as John's Gospel. There was a very strong opinion that John's Gospel was actually written by a Gnostic. And some of the early church fathers rejected it. The crucifixion has no extant witnesses, no extant eyewitness reports, according to a near consensus of historians. So when this verse was revealed about Jesus in the Quran in the year 625 or something of the Common Era, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify Jesus. Okay? And that those who differ therein are following dhan. Dhan means conjecture, like guesswork or hearsay. At that time, I can imagine the Christians and the Jews coming to the Prophet Muhammad and saying, what, what, do you, what do you mean? They have Matthew's gospel. Matthew's a disciple. And he's writing about the crucifixion. John is a disciple. And he wrote about the crucifixion. Well, as studies of the New Testament progressed in the 18th century, 19th century, Today, there's almost a near consensus that these books are anonymous, that these books are attributed to these four men, right, who did not write them. These books are anonymous. They're not written by disciples. They're not written by eyewitnesses. They're not written by uh, disciples of eyewitnesses. So we have no extant eyewitness reports, according to a near consensus of historians, of anyone who saw the crucifixion, so-called crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. The crucifixion was a major cause of dissension. Paul uses the word eris. Eris is the Greek god of strife in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians is what Paul is really thinking. Like in Romans, he's kind of you know, holding back a little bit and he's being more philosophical. But in Galatians, you know, towards the end of Galatians, he said, now write this down in big, bold letters. He says that to his scribe. Right? This is what I really think. So Galatians 3.1. Oh, stupid Galatians, who has bewitched you? This is how he says it. Who has bewitched you uh, that you now follow a different gospel? Hetaran Evangelion. There's another gospel? And then Alan Iesun, another Jesus? Didn't I clearly portray him as crucified before your eyes? Didn't I clearly portray him as crucified? You see, the problem with Paul is we only have one side of the phone conversation. You ever hear like someone talking on the phone? You can hear what this guy's saying, but what's that guy saying? You don't know. What, what do you think Paul is responding to here? It seems like he's responding to Christians in Galatia who denied the crucifixion. Well, how did they, where'd they get that idea from? Well, according to F.C. Bauer, the eminent New Testament scholar, when Paul went to Galatia and evangelized them with his gospel, again, he calls it my gospel, and he leaves, James sends men into Galatia to correct Paul's gospel. This is standard exegesis. You can read this, F.C. Bauer. And so it seems like the Galatians are getting this idea that Jesus wasn't crucified from James himself. When I am gone, wherever you are, go to James the Just, Ya'aquf had sadiq, for whose, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. The crucifixion was first mentioned by Paul, who claimed to have received his gospel via direct revelation, not from the disciples. He's very adamant about this. Right? So his so-called creed in 1 Corinthians 15, he actually, you have to read that in the sort of scheme of his entire corpus, where he says in Galatians, I received this gospel from no man. It was, it was taught directly to me by revelation of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion is something that we don't know for certain what the actual disciples believed about. 
They likely believed in, as Paul says, another gospel, another Jesus, compared to Paul's gospel. The crucifixion is mentioned in the gospels, but many events in the gospel passion narratives are highly implausible historically, either fictitious, symbolic, or mimetic of Hellenistic literature. I can give you many, many examples of this. Many, many examples of midnight trial in the Sanhedrin, Jesus being tried in the house of the high priest. This is completely against Jewish law. You say, well, they made an exception. Okay, but that's implausible. That's not plausible. Who betrayed Jesus? Judas, right? What is, who? Judas Iscariot. Yehuda Ishkarioth. Oh, how convenient. A Jew from the cities. You know, you know these, these country bumpkin disciples of his who can't read or write, these fishermen, swindled by a city-slicking Jew. This seems to be an anti-Jewish trope. Is this historical? Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross of Jesus, uh, following Jesus, take up a cross and follow me, Simon. Simon is Peter, he couldn't do it, but this Simon can do it. Many examples of this. Uh, the Pascal pardon, the way that Pontius Pilate is, is uh, described in the gospels clashes severely with how Philo of Alexandria de describes him. Other historians, the way they describe Pontius Pilate would not have a second of compunction in swatting any Jewish rebel. He was absolutely ruthless. Yet you have him bring out the two Jesuses. They're both Jesus, by the way. Jesus bar Abba, Yeshua bar Abba, Yeshua Hanutsri, who shall I release unto you? A Pascal pardon. You know, trying to release him. This is completely against the description of Pilate and other sources outside the New Testament. It's highly implausible. Maybe Jesus just had that effect on people, and he probably did. But historically, this is highly implausible. And there's other examples. Oh, the useful, <laughs> the JFK assassination is a useful example. Because the charge that Muslims get all the time is, you guys are denying a historical fact. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. It's a historical fact. Interestingly, you know, the JFK assassination, okay, happened 50 years ago in broad daylight with video cameras, eyewitnesses, and to this day, we still don't know exactly what happened. You're telling me 2,000 years ago, we know exactly what happened to someone, no eyewitnesses, no technology, nothing. You know exactly what happened? No, you don't. You don't know what happened. And if you read these sources, if you look at these sources, the context behind these sources, you'll see that there's massive eris, Paul calls eris, strife, major strife about the crucifixion. Not just what it means, did he die for our sins, or do we have to follow the uh, halakha, or what, 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 can we be Ben Noach? No, 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 no. Did this thing actually happen? Didn't I portray him as crucified? Who portrayed him otherwise? That's the subtext. And then in 1975, you have the Zapruder video. Remember this thing? Zapruder, Abraham Zapruder video. So everyone believed it was Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Until 1975. And here comes this video, 13 years later, 12 years later, that shows Kennedy sitting in his motorcade. And then as Jim Garrison used to say, the bullet comes and he goes back into the left. Oh, okay, the bullet's coming from here. He's going this way. Ah. Now nothing is conclusive, but like this Quranic ayah, this verse is like that Zapruder video. The Quran is saying they followed conjecture. And they go back and look at the sources. These are not written by eyewitnesses. We have to think about this. But historians are dragging their feet on this issue. They need to reassess the evidence here. You know, they don't want to look at some Muslim source. There's a little bit of bias, I think, especially with the Orientalists and neo Orientalists. Anyway. So, the Christological middle way. There's a verse from the Quran. Oh, people of the Bible, ya ahl al-kitab. People of the Revelation, kitab, right, could mean Bible. And the Bible means book, kitab means book. Do not, in this, and in this, sorry, in this verse, the Jews and Christians are being directly addressed according to the context. Do not go to extremes in your religion, and do not say about God except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, is indeed nothing but God's messenger and his word that he cast to Mary and a spirit from him. 
So believe in God and his messengers. And do not say three. Now, interesting here, the Quran is, thalatha. Just don't say three. So any type of three. The Quran is not saying, don't say three persons, don't say three beings, don't say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, don't say Father, Son, uh, Mother. Just don't say three. Innam Allahu ilahun wahid. For your God is one. Highly exalted to see they should have a son. And again, son here. Okay, let me explain this. Okay. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali, one of our great scholars, he said, during the time of Bani Israel, Bani Israel, right? During the time of the children of Israel when they had the prophecy, uh, father and son, these terms were used honorifically, figuratively. Right? So for example, Isaiah 64, 16, Atta Adonai Avinu, you are the Lord our Father. Right? In the Psalms, uh, you, are, um, you are my beloved. Kulakim, uh, you are all sons of God. Right? In the Psalms. So this is meant to be figurative. But here the Quran is talking about this idea that Jesus is the Son of God in his metaphysical sense. Or even in a physical sense, because Mormons believe in this kind of physical sense. But this idea that God shares anything, that the Father shares anything with other persons, this is called perichoresis. This is a Trinitarian doctrine. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate and distinct persons for each, each one fully God, in and of itself, in and of himself. They share in the actions, and uh, 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 they share in their actions, and they're inseparable in thought and consciousness. They're, they're of one mind. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth, and God suffice, suffices as a trustee. So the Jewish position regarding Jesus, this is a traditional Jewish position. If you read the Talmud, for example, he was a false prophet and a pseudo-messiah. You might get someone who will say, well, he was you know, just a rabbi who made a mistake. You know, this guy Ben Shapiro uh, just recently said he was a criminal who wanted to start an insurrection, and he was uh, killed by the Romans. There's been many of them. You have the other extreme... Christian position regarding Jesus, he's God incarnate, a divine savior. The Muslim position, he's a great messenger and prophet Messiah. And this is the conclusion. That is Jesus. This is what our brother read from the Quran. That is Jesus, son of Mary. And this is a word of truth about which they dispute. In other words, the aforementioned Christology that the Quran is mentioning, this is the truth about Jesus that all these people are disputing about. So thank you for listening. I hope I didn't offend you, but I wanted to be honest with you and give you what I believe to be the traditional Muslim position and my position regarding our Christology. Thank you so much.